In this program today, we're going to be talking about fundamental aspects of our spiritual life, and in concrete, why people do not go to church after Easter. Is my faith an emotional faith? What is the difference between a faith really based in the sacraments or a religiosity made of sentimentality? Am I a convinced Christian? Why people do not go to church on Sundays? Let's find the answer in this new episode of Salve Maria, the podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. Welcome to Salve Maria, the podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. Salve Maria, welcome to this new episode of the podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. Brother Justin, Salve Maria, how are you? Salve Maria, I'm doing well, thank you. So we're here today and we're going to tackle a topic that is, I think, very, very important, not only for our own spirituality, but also for everybody who listens to us. Because I don't know if it is happened, this happens to you, Brother Justin, as well, but, you know, we're always in church. We're fresh off um, Holy Week. And uh, and again, this, this probably strikes you that we are in church and then we see a multitude of people and then we're thinking, okay, this is church for Holy Week. This is church for uh, Easter Sunday. How beautiful it could be if all these people were here every Sunday, no? And then, then, then we then we come to the to this topic, uh, the topic of today: why people do not go to church. Uh, so this is this is the topic of the day. But first of all, let me start by. Uh, thanking everyone who's following the podcast, all those who are following us in Radio Maria Canada, a Catholic voice in your home, a special greeting to them. Also for all those audiences that are following us in uh, YouTube, uh, in, through WhatsApp and in many, many other places that we don't even know that they are there. So welcome to all. Brother Justin, we had this issue about why people don't go to church, right? So uh, I don't know. What's your what's your topic? My angle. My, your angle. Yeah, My angle. Go. I believe that the problem with the um, absence at church has to do with the expectations people have when they do go to church. Um, many people who go to church, and we're talking about changing generations here, they go to church out of a couple of different reasons. You might find some of the older generation, they go because their parents went. In the old country, they went to church, they go to church. Because this is what you do on Sunday. That's what you do. And if you ask them why they go to church, they really have no answer. There is no real solid. It's just what you do. Some of them, it may be that they go to church, then they gather the family around the table and the generations have a meal together. And that's the family tradition. And if you don't, you're excommunicato. That's it. There's no it questions. follows pretty much on the inertia of everyone else who did it before us. And therefore, this is what you don't understand. But at the same time, you know, what happens when people basically tend to forget the reasons? And also, there is something too. I mean, the more, the, the younger the Catholics are, you realize that in some of them, they are eager to receive the sacrament. And that's the whole reason there. But people who are poorly catechized eventually, right? We just don't know. It's just church. Right? Yeah, I, I, I was going to get to that point, which is that the, the COVID situation really broke this, the, this customary uh, devotional person because they no longer could do it. They couldn't, they couldn't do what they always did. So it questioned, okay, I can't go for one, two, three months, what have you. After COVID, does it actually have a reason anymore? And for many of them, it doesn't. That's one problem. Another one is that people don't get a feeling out of it. But this is very, very, very obvious that at the root of the problem is probably the complete ignorance of what the sacraments are for, right? Because if, if we go to mass, right? But for us, receiving communion doesn't mean anything. The sacraments don't mean anything, confession, communion. Then all of a sudden, you're okay just sitting down at home and watching uh, Mass on TV. If you do that. If. 
if you do five minutes of that, you move on. I, I think the bigger problem is, I think there was a Pew uh, Research uh, survey a little while ago, a couple of years ago, and I think it's only getting worse, which less than 70% of the Catholics in the Pews believed in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Now, oh, mass, no, no, it's less than that. It's, it's t three over ten, I think. Uh, three it's, people it's, believe. It's and terrible. The don't, it's yeah. absolutely hideous. But the problem lies here is that when there is a lack of belief in the true presence, the mass loses its meaning. The early church, they gathered for the Eucharist. They didn't gather for a social gathering. They didn't gather for an eloquent speech by a local apostle. They gathered for the Eucharist. Everything else was a bonus. And there we end up with the expectations which change, which are different. And because they're different, uh, they're wrong, um, we have Catholics who say, oh, yes, I, I, I feel bad if I don't go to Mass. But Joel Olstein, he makes me feel good. Yeah, good f feeling good. That's that's also something that we're going to tackle in a moment. But so why people don't go to church is basically the what that we're missing the the practice and the understanding of what the sacraments mean. For instance, you were talking about the early Christians, no? And the early Christians had something that was impressive. And I don't think we would be talking about these things. So I don't think people would be going to church uh, if they at the root. No, the early Christians were not there with their faith. Now, they uh, traditionally, the early Christians would start uh, mass, no, attending mass. Let's say, you know, on the eve, in the, on the eve, on Saturday eve. At the time, there was no point. There was nothing existing there. That okay, Sunday is a free day because you know <laughs> it was the first day of the week. It was a work day. It was a work day, and 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 Christians were not, you know, a power in in in, in any community, right? They were they illegal. Were just, they <laughs> were completely. And then what happens? Well, they would start on Saturday evening and they would start their prayers in anticipation because they would say, okay, Sunday, either Jesus comes back for the second time, we're going to meet him in person, or we're going to meet him in the Eucharist. And I don't think this is, you know, our Catholic perspective now in 2023. I, I think worse than that, um, I think there's such a, um, a lack of dedication, a lack of true belief in the uh, centrality of our faith that um, we end up with a problem of why do I exist, this, this, this existential crisis. Yes. Um, if you go to some of the most simple, simple uh, diocesan uh, catechisms that exist, you'll find this also, of course, in the um, Catechism of the Council of Trent, and you find it in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's both in, in both. But in it, it says, what is the finality of man? To know, love, and serve God and be happy with him in heaven. That is what it, what it counts. And if we understand that centrality point, then Mass makes sense. There is a reason for it. There's no reason if I am not made for God, and that is not my centrality, it's not my purpose. Now, there's your problem. That's when you get this lukewarmness, where every, you'd go to church because it's a cultural event, or you go to church because grandma, grandma wants everyone at church, or um, what have you. That's where the problem is. It's an existential crisis, which is that, what was I made for? So the moment we want to strengthen our families, the moment we want to strengthen our young people and everything else, basically, yes, I mean, we have to pick up the catechism and also ourselves understand not only the beauty, but why we believe. No? I, I, was, I, I just heard a message from someone sending it to me, and what was shocking I found to it was the lack of substance, lack of understanding, the lack of belief. It's what we do. Uh, we do it this way. No, it's not we do. No, we don't do. It is what is true and what is not true. Um, our God is not um, a God who was manufactured in a mall in the same way that you may buy a bear for your child, in which you m uh, model this God in as an idol, 
in the an image of yourself and your likes and dislikes. How it feels, no? It's an emotional it. impact. Um, you like blonde, you don't like blonde, you like it pudgy, you like it thin. No. There is a, a there was a, a Twitter post by uh, by a Catholic priest from the United States, and it's very, very interesting. I, I don't resist to, to read it a little bit. We're actually going to read across so that we can uh, somehow come to the you know the, the deep roots of why people don't go to church, right? And why after after Easter we find again the churches you know desolated empty. and empty and everything else, and that's it. The crowd doesn't come anymore. And by the way, if we read the catechism, uh, and the catechism says that that Sunday mass, <laughs> if we don't attend. Sunday, Sunday Mass, no, we commit a mortal sin. So that's something very important to remind everyone. But it, it's funny, this, this, the ones who forget this, um, they, they make a big point about days of obligation. But if you, if you read, if you read it properly, days of obligation are supplemental to the Sunday, where we celebrate Easter every Sunday. Well, yes, not just yeah. once a year. Exactly, you know, not just one, just twice a year or something. But this, uh, the, this, this priest says something very beautiful, and I'm going to read. He says, occasionally a person, often a parent, will come to me expressing a desire to deepen his or her Christian life and the life of his family or her family. Finally, take it serious. Be more intentional. The desire is real, beautiful. For better or worse, they come to me for advice. But then I tell them simply to go to confession, pray daily, and stop treating youth sports like a religion. <laughs> no? And that's important. And then I tell them never, ever miss Sunday Mass. And often, he confesses, that's when I lose them, for they weren't looking for that. So, and they're looking for what, he says. Well, mostly I think they are after a feeling, maybe a perspective, a devotion, something tinged with sentimentality, nothing that calls into question practices, habits, forms of life, ethics, nothing that has to do with repentance and change. Uh, his, his post continues, right? But I think we have touched eh, the, the, the issue, is that people feel, and probably after Easter, they feel motivated and they say, well, why don't go to Mass? Well, this was so beautiful. Why don't we go to Mass every Sunday? And then here is when, you know, the questions come. How can I be more intentional in my faith? And then there is no magic bullet, right? <laughs> there is no magic bullet. There is no, no. There we go. I, I think he has a couple very good points in that, in that introductory part. One of them is, is that people come with great ideas, but many times if you listen very closely when they come, they come up with ideas that the person listening must do for them. So they come, like up, with, they come up with ideas for the other person to do for them. We should have a devotion which you're going to pray on this day. And if, and, and the if Knights they, of Columbus are going to organize it, right? <laughs> well, someone will organize it, and someone will attend it. And what's really disheartening in this situation, and I've met many young priests who have been, in a sense, hoodwinkled by this. The person comes with this charge of emotion and happiness and enthusiasm. We have to do this and that. And they themselves, this very person, this very family, never attend. They think I'm back anymore. Great ideas for others to do, um, because it's based in an emotional um, seedbed. It's not based in the land of habits, which are virtues. Virtues are good dispositions, which are practiced continually, habitually, which gives us the virtues. It isn't a one-off thing. I'm yes. going to pray a rosary today. That doesn't make me a daily prayer. Uh, I receive communion tomorrow. That doesn't make me a daily communicant. In the same sense, if I tell the truth once, that doesn't make me honest. If I tell a lie once, it doesn't make me a liar yet. There you go. Once I get into a habit, and there's the issue, is that faith demands consistency. It's a practice which is rooted in the virtue, again, virtue, habitual element of religion. Religion is a virtue that has to be practiced. But now we could say also that religion requires 
a, a, a big dose of assiduous practice. No, because imagine, Asceticism is very important. No, also, but you have to be intentional and you also have to be at the same time perseverant. Right? Oh, absolutely. Because it has no it, value otherwise. <laughs> imagine, no, we all go to, let's say, I don't know, a big supermarket or a big uh, sports place, whatever, and we go there and we buy weights, right? Yeah. And we buy all the weights and then we go there and we set up a gym and everything else. But imagine that those weights always are on the floor. All of a sudden, they are collecting that. What are the weights going to do for you? Absolutely nothing, because unless we lift them every morning, right, they are not going to 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 bring us the benefits that, that we're looking for. Or also, you know, if you pay attention, the question of vitamins, right? Imagine you you fill your your kitchen with vitamins and you don't even touch them, right? I mean, vitamins are going to work the more we take them. I think the big problem with religion is that we have a tendency of judging. Uh, by the ones who don't do it, not by those who actually attend. And by the way, the reason of this program is not to say they don't come to church. It's a, all of us that have this issue, right? Well, it's, we don't why, it's why we're in such a religious crisis. And this is what's interesting with this point is that it's a, 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 a crisis which crosses the limits of Christianity and, and other world religions, okay? And it's a crisis of... The people of today, it's a generational crisis of lack of perseverance in anything. The quiet quitting that's going on now is the same idea. Oof, that's people don't want to do, do things over. that are difficult, that take perseverance. The problem with sports today is that it's something that they have to do on a constant basis and, pe and the kids are not interested. But we live in a culture of instant gratification. No, it has participation to be instant. Participation awards. Participation awards. No, you collect all these you know, uh, badges and if you don't collect badges, oh my goodness, there, there's nothing happening. Yeah, there's a, there's a story I read about this, um, this first communion class and uh, this, this, this child had missed large segments of their formation that the parish was doing. You mean large ca segments. catechesis, preparation? For grade, for grade for two, grade two, it would be it would be a classroom idea. And finally, the catechists had uh, exasperated themselves. They most likely had approached the family uh, time and time again, uh, trying to figure out the poor attendance so what was you going are missing on? classes that's like and yeah. and the formation wasn't there finally they informed this family that they were not going to be receiving communion uh, this child would not be receiving holy communion that year they would be put off till the next year and at which point explosion explosion <laughs> oh. the, the the provivial clo uh, robes were torn horror demand to speak to the manager etc etc the parish priest has a sit down with them. Call the bishop immediately. <laughs> oh, absolutely. He wrote five letters to the bishop. And the the priest sits down and, and tries to reason with them. And through the dialogue, he comes to this very clear understanding that this child who's to receive Holy Communion is not there for a moment of gaining some form of understanding of who they are about to receive in the Eucharist is not trying to build a relationship with Jesus Christ. No, it's a party. It's a moment. It's a feeling. And it's not right. The, the, the First Communion has been chalked up to childhood events such as going to Walt Disney World or um, having a birthday party at your favorite place in town or um, you know, traveling to Europe. It's those things that you do for the child to have a beautiful childhood. And this priest and this parish were ruining the childhood of this, of this, of this uh, child. The problem is, is that Holy Communion is an encounter with Jesus Christ. That's what it is. Everything else is extra. And unfortunately, there's your issue with faith, is that it's not faith. It's an emotional impact of sorts. And so there we go with the impact, emotional impact, no? Because if it doesn't become, if our Catholic faith doesn't become, as he says here, practices, habits, forms of life, ethic, um, nothing like repentance and change, then we have a problem. 
right? And, and, and this is the moment when actually every single Catholic, I think, has difficulties, right? But this is where, where we are called to, to, to practice our faith based exactly on, okay, what faith has as a repercussion in my life? right? What faith does for me that is going to eventually make me change and be a different person? Who is Jesus Christ? Mm. Is Jesus Christ the one of revelation? The one in whom we encounter in the Gospels? Is it God the Father that we encounter in the Old Testament? Is it the Holy Spirit that we encounter through all of divine uh, revelation? Or have I invented my own personal Jesus Christ? Am I made in the image and likeness of God? Or am I the God who invents God? So perhaps what I just said, is the is the then the, the the problem that people don't go to church because they are looking for instant gratification. And that instant gratification simply doesn't happen every Sunday. Is that is that because for instance you have you know the, the case of uh, Naaman. No, Naaman is, is, is for for those who like Patron to read in the Bible. For those who, who like to read the Bible, you go to the story of, of the prophet Elisha, and then you see he was a general, and he had all of a sudden he was a Syrian general, and he had uh, this uh, this issue. He had leprosy. He was a pagan. And then one uh, one Jewish girl that is working there in his kind of you know court of the of the of the of the general goes and says, "Well, there is a man of God in my country. Maybe you can go there. He will cure you." you no, know? and so he actually goes and travels down. He goes to Judea, and there he he goes to visit the prophet Elijah. And Prophet Elisha goes and says, uh, this didn't, I think he didn't even come to the door. Elisha sends a, um, a messenger to say, to tell him what to do. To tell him what to do. I mean, you're looking for a cure, right? So you go to this man of God, you travel, at, I think at least was 200 kilometers. And then when you arrive there, they tell you what to do. But no, what he really want, because at a certain moment, you know, the messenger says, Oh, the prophet says that you should go to the river Jordan and wash seven times. And then he takes it like a complete lack of respect. Who is this person? I am a general. There are no what rivers in my country. Does not does Damascus not have better water? That was his question. So the problem was not to find a solution for his issues, but rather am I being taken, you know? Uh, in, in, into consideration by this. You know, yeah, and the whole story man. ends up getting very interesting because the the same Jewish uh, servant says, if you were asked for something very difficult, you would do it. Do what the man of God wants. And then he goes and washes and he comes out, comes out clean. But you might say he had a superstitious relationship with the God of Israel. So people tell us, oh yes, you want you want to strengthen your faith? Go to Mass every Sunday, go to confession, receive communion, pray the rosary. No, you know, that is not... I'm looking for something else. <laughs> I'm looking for... I'm looking for someone to wave hands over my head and, I don't know, lightning to come from the sky. That experience, being knocked down by the Holy Spirit. I mean, hey, what? So then, why people don't go to church? Maybe because we're expecting things that are like Naaman. Eh? We just think we are too important and we need to have these feelings that are going to be completely sensitive? That's a question to make, no? That element is, is, is key. I think also there's an element of relativism in which we encounter um, the God of Revelation. And in that sense of an encounter, what we do is that we make God, uh, God can be anything. God can be Buddha, God can be uh, Vishu, can be you know, Apollo, can be whatever, it just everything's the same, it's all good, it's all, it's all good, it's all God, it's all God. No, there is truth and there's error. And in that sense, we end up encountering the God of Revelation, and in that God of Revelation, we are expected to do what he tells us to do, namely, in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments. In the New Testament, the Beatitudes. And all of those requests that are made. And the church then gives us more directions. But the problem is we want something that's easy. It doesn't take any effort. 
that probably in three or four Sundays we're going to be fixing everything, no? And it does take longer than three or four Sundays. Eh? That takes longer. Ah, for instance, here, 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 this, this, this priest were quoting. He says, it, you know, it's salvation in daily basis that what we need is daily work of holiness. And I find that very, very wise, and probably something that is going to help us tremendously to take control of our spiritual life. Right, Brother Justin? Because the more we go and uh, and do the daily work of holiness, eh, the more we do these um, elements of real Catholicism, which is changing our habits, leaving the precepts of the church, right? It's not complicated, it's not trendy, it's not sensitive, but it's the longer work that no, has effects. This build your own deity mentality, the modern person loses his own mind in believing that his heart is the standard, it's the only standard of a reality, and designs his own God. He spawns his own higher power and projects himself and his fallenness on his pseudo-deity. Such a person ends up worshipping only himself. There's your reason why people don't feel fed. <laughs> what are they feeding? The Joel Osteen, feel good about yourself. Don't judge yourself. Everything is good. You're perfect as you are. People, look in the mirror. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. No I mean, one just is. embrace the reality. But the problem is that they don't, they don't embrace the reality. Why? Because they're adoring themselves. Their vain glory is overflowing. It's sort of like a person who wants to praise God, but in front of them, they have a mirror and they're adoring themselves. So, well, here is the recipe, the shorter recipe probably, right? If you want real Catholicism, Father says here, work at it. Show up, change your habits, leave the priestess of the church. It is not complicated or trendy. It is just daily work, sacred habits, piety, instability. Anything telling you anything else, anyone telling you anything else, is selling you something. So it's selling us what? An hedonistic understanding of religion, right? As fallen human beings, this is very important, we should have a healthy suspicion of ourselves. We should be suspicious when we feel that something is the right way of doing it. This is the only way. I feel, when you hear the I feel, there should be, the person themselves should have a check on it, saying, hmm, there's something wrong. Hmm, I should, I should check it against something which is not myself. So that we don't recreate God according to our own desires, our own worldview, or our own capacity to fully understand Him. Our task is not to change God, but to allow the living God to change us, to convert our hearts, to love Him and worship Him more faithfully. Sounds like we want God to adapt to us instead of us adapting to God. Well, we want Him made in our image. Right? Yeah. We're, we're trying to say, I am already perfect. God needs to know and it needs to do what I want. And then it is my God. But when there is a covenant, you know, I'm going to be your God. All the covenants, the seven covenants, you know, in the in this in the in the Holy Scripture, the, uh, yes, um, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. But there is a set of commandments, no, in which God doesn't change. Is that we change according to what God wants from One us? One thing that we forget, and this comes up many times in the Old Testament, is that God would say, "I am a jealous God. Have no gods beside me." And when we're making our own idols. We're offending God in the first commandment. And we expect to be blessed afterwards. Mm. <laughs> we expect difficult. God to fulfill what? When we are already broken the covenant. We already broke the relationship. Um, the confession question is really interesting because people say, um, uh, I've encountered this many times, and talking to priests, it's kind of funny because it's like, you know, they're like, they roll their eyes, right? The person will, will talk to someone and say, no, no, I, I'm not going to go to Mass today because I don't feel right. So if the person was in sin, in, in serious sin, where they couldn't go to communion, they just augmented a sin against, on top of that, by not attending the Sunday Mass. 
But then afterwards, miraculously, they begin to feel good. And in feeling good, then they go to Mass the next Sunday and receive communion. There is this subjective causal element which makes absolutely no sense. So in other words, I mean, let's remember that, right? Catechism teaches us we can't miss Mass on Sunday. It's a mortal sin, right? And also we cannot receive Holy Communion when we're in mortal sin. Right. We need to go to If I haven't been to Mass for the last eight months of the year, and it's um, Christmas or New Year's or my nephew's uh, First <laughs> Holy Communion or my niece's First uh, Communion ceremony, Let's I am not a Catholic in good standing. Yep. This, this sa the sacraments are such, you know. Uh, sure, I've received Holy Communion. Yes, I have uh, received confession once in my life. I'm now 45, and I have not gone to confession since. Um, there's some housekeeping necessary before I go back to receive the Lord. It is not because you feel good on that day that you are now going to go to communion. I mean, hey, we need to pay attention and be more serious, right? If we are not attending Mass, well, let's put together no, all our, our life, right, in front of, that's why we have confession. But also, there is something very, very important, perhaps, you know, to, 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 to come back to, to the point, Brother Jethro, which says, um, we cannot chase when looking for God. We cannot change, chase after gimmicks or feelings. Eh? Let's go to Mass, let's leave the sacraments, and yes, you want to say something? No, I'm just saying, I'm going to go with that point here. At the very beginning of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it teaches us God is infinitely perfect, blessed in himself, in, a, in the plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. That's right at the beginning of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The so, plan of salvation is a plan of sheer goodness. Sheer goodness. God wants to share his own life with us. That's it, right? And, but, but it depends on us too. I mean, there is a lot of, like you were saying, no, a lot of home, uh, home housekeeping no, to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you look at it, he is perfect. He is infinitely perfect. He doesn't need to be rebooted. He doesn't, not like your computer or your phone or what have you. He doesn't need to be upgraded. He doesn't need you to remake him. But right. we need to abide by terms that are fundamental, and if and that requires and those are time. objective, and that requires time, and it's objective. Cannot be instant gratification. We cannot attain sanctity just from one moment to the next, right? Although there are graces, yes, I know there are many saints that have received that grace, right? But hey, no, no, <laughs> we need to do everything we have to do, and then grace comes. But Justin, let's go to a commercial and then we come back with, okay, what can we do to build this uh, true piety, this, this true meaning of going to church every Sunday? We come back in a moment. If you're liking the podcast and if you're liking the program, consider making a donation. This is going to help us to reach many thousands of Catholics who would also like to listen to the podcast and also to have access to this fantastic information we are trying to share. So go down, share, click the notifications, uh, leave us a comment. This is fundamental and we're going to be completely thankful to you and your friends. But also, again, make a donation so that we can reach many more people through social media. So welcome to our second part of the program. We are debating here and talking about different aspects of our faith, especially, namely, uh, we're trying to find an answer on why uh, so many Catholics don't go to Mass on Sunday. And so, Brother Justin, what is the meaning then of, what is the problem with feelings or with uh, just a Catholicity that is based on sentimentality only? Well, firstly, our emotions will betray us nine out of ten times. Um, we know that within our own lives, right? When we look at, okay, just a simple thing, love, the word love. Love has four interpretations, four Greek words which we translate into the word love. Yes. The lowest and most base of the four is eros, which is passionate or erotic love. But the love that a parent has for their child is more elevated. Way more 
and you have stodge and what have you. But what's important is that the love that we have for our own is a love which is sacrificial, which is not dependent on the emotions. Believe me, there are mothers who are staying up with their children and they're not overflowing with tickly love when their child has kept them up for the third night in a row. They have sacrificial love. They're willing to die for their child. That's real love. The same way here. Our faith has to be based on conviction, has to be based on something far more. But how are you going to love something we don't know? That's how do you kind serve of, something you don't know? That's kind of impossible, right? It's impossible, it's... absolutely. So now there are some points here we wanted to go through because uh, we are we are following a post here of, of Twitter in, in to one of our of, of of the people we follow here is a priest from the states and he's saying that if you want truly freeing Catholicism, the sort that changes your life, he says, well, simple, go to mass, leave the sacraments, let the timing and shape of liturgies shape your life. So I'm going to uh, I'm gonna you know I would like to to delve into this. So going to mass we already spoke about, but then leaving the sacraments. How do we leave the sacraments and how we understand them so that they motivate that we say, oh, no, no, I cannot miss Sunday Mass. I'm going to miss communion. I'm going to miss, you know, confession. That's life-changing. I think we need to firstly look at the catechesis, uh, of a catechesis of what is baptism, how we are a new creation with baptism, how we um, are loved, how we are adopted, we are turned into a child of God. We are no longer creatures of God. And to really understand what, what was given to us through baptism, um, and then live our confirmation, be truly witness to, of the faith, understanding that, then the Eucharist, the summit of the Christian life, becomes something. Um, and when we have our failings, we recourse to the, the, the seat of mercy, which is confession. Um, we activate the sacraments. One activates the other. Um, those, those, of, those, those who are married live their marriages as a sacrament, not as just something as a social contract which can be disposed of, uh, maneuvered around, or, God forbid, being unfaithful to, day to day, right? It's something that's an a inconvenience. If we understand what God really means with sharing his own life with us, that's probably a life-changing uh, moment. But if we just don't have that into consideration, uh, yeah, I mean, going to church becomes a social practice, that's all. Because boring. Because then what happens is, it's like someone who came to me going, oh, I, I, I go to Mass now, but the priest there, he's boring. But if you're going there for the Eucharist, the priest being boring doesn't matter. Because you're not there for, pa for Padre Cito, you're there for Jesus Christ who was going to be on that altar, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Not some type of symbolic presence, but him truly present in the same manner that he was present in Calvary 2,000 years ago. So then first hint, yes, go to Mass. Yes, go and uh, celebrate the sacraments. But then something more important too. Let the timing and shape of liturgies shape your life. Celebrate the feast days in your family. Devotions. Devotions. For example, last, our last episode, we were talking about divine mercy, right? That's something which would really activate your Holy Week if you celebrated the Divine Mercy. Um, we're going forward. We're having Corpus Christi. We have um, the Assumption of Our Lady. We have the Ascension, which is coming up very uh, within days. We have these are the rhythm of the church. The colors at church, the understand the liturgy becomes something so much more. When we understand the readings, we read the readings beforehand. We 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 dip ourselves into the balm of what is the gospel and what are the readings from the Acts of the Apostles and from the Old Testament. We allow that to come through us and we live it. 
Can be comparable, perhaps, you know, when we go to church, we go to mass, and then we let for several months, as, as Father says here, that the shape of liturgies shape our life, no? It could also be compared, I don't know, imagine a person who lives, well, like, like us here in Canada, no, long winter, you don't have sun, right? And then we are all tend to be pale, because, of course, the lack of sun here. No? Most of the Canadian population, I think, it takes vitamin D, D3 in, in pills, because, you know... That or has all those happy needs. machines, those blue, those blue light machines that kind of cheer them up a little bit. We need that. But then, imagine, no, you just don't see the sun. And then you go run maybe to Central America, you know, one of those places, no? And the now Caribbean. You, yeah, you get all the sun and now you come back red, you know, red, big, red like a lobster. Okay. Uh, and then for another, another, what, three, four, five months, you just go again, again into the polar, polar ice. But everyone knows that if you're going to expose yourself to the sun, you build up a tan so that you don't end up scorching yourself. <laughs> How do you get cancer, skin cancer? No? <laughs> so, but this, you know, it's an analogy to say, I mean, yeah, I go to church uh, on Sunday. Uh, Sunday, no, Easter Sunday. And then I don't go anymore. And then I come back in Christmas. And then I don't go anymore, right? We are missing that healthy exposure that is constantly Sunday after Sunday. That is not going to give you your vitamin D, right? It's also going to make sure that that tanning that you that that you are talking about, right, is basically the, fa the, the the face of God that looks at us. He looks at us and then transforms us out of love. If we do that every Sunday, it's going to be a building, no? If we don't do that, well, you know, false starts all the time, you know? And then, of course, it's never uh, an interesting experience. I think also there's a problem, which is that people look at it saying it's not interesting. If I were to introduce you to, um, let's say, a historical period, but you have no background, you have no knowledge of where it's situated, no knowledge of the characters that are involved, the main characters, how they fit into the global history. You're going to find it absolutely boring. But if you are... Most have, people don't know what they're talking about, right? What the priest is talking about, no? no. But if you, if, you, if you allow yourself to be somewhat knowledgeable, to understand these historic periods, which are fascinating, become alive because we have an interest because we've allowed ourselves to imbue ourselves with that historic period and we end up taking out many lessons the liturgy is the same way we need to imbue ourselves in the liturgy to allow the liturgy to help us to uh, guide us and to build us up and he says no shape the liturgies let the shape and timing of liturgies shape your life do it until it becomes a habit the spiritual structure of your being what an interesting thing because uh, virtues that don't become habits cannot be called virtues no uh, vir uh, uh, a virtue is by itself a habit it's a hashtag. It's and it's, don't forget, religion is a, ha is a virtue it's a virtue <laughs> the virtue of religiosity right it's a virtue it's a virtue so but then, of course, we have that, that fundamental element in which the constant participation is, is, is basic. If, if we don't have that, no, we don't build. One thing that is very true, and I see this um, so many times, uh, it comes actually from teaching children. As the children get a little bit older, and many of them serve at the altar, when we're doing catechism, with catechism, they begin to pick up different points. And when they're paying attention at Mass, it's funny to watch. I, I pointed out in one of my classes talking about liturgy how the, 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 the mode from past to present is reflected in the Eucharistic prayer. One of the children comes to me on a Monday. They had been at Mass. They had served at the altar. And they were like, I can't believe it. Exactly. We're, it's when he says, holy, holy, it's all of heaven that is there. I didn't realize that. What? This child is beginning to live the liturgy. He's not sitting in the back, bored, flipping through the bulletin or, or flipping or worse, flipping to his phone in church, not paying attention. He's seeing that moment of which heaven 
touches earth. And you see, sometimes you know, parents and they pure her wrong. Sometimes it, this happens, and this is not you know to judge people or to put them down, but uh, this this is something that that should change. You know, when they're children that are not that small already, uh, at, uh, are at a, a, an age that they could be understanding what's happening, right? Instead of explaining to them and instead of telling them, listen, be quiet, we are in church, right? Oh no, the kid starts jumping up and down. Number one is cute, and number two they get him a juice or get him that. Hey, hold on. If he or she, the child, is already at the age of starting to understand things, teach them the respect that they should have in church. And then slowly you're going to build their notion of the Holy Presence in the Temple of God. In certain in certain places, I've seen it, I had it when I, I saw it when I was a child, it exists till today, is that they have a child's missile, in which is made up of pictures, small amount of text, so basically grade one, grade two, grade three, usually grade one and two in kindergarten, which explains the key points, key keystones of the liturgy so that they can follow it and they can see and understand. That's something useful. Turning mass into a buffet an entertaining of little moment bags for children, you know, of bags, <laughs> bags. Of, of bags of cereal in which they, cereal, they keep juice. munching um, and they distract everyone around them. It's not helping the child because the child ends up thinking in their mind that church is just a means of getting their favorite treats. They don't know why they're there. They're not paying attention. So here we go. Let the shape and liturgies shape your life and do it until it becomes a habit, the spiritual structure of your being. Then, he says, you will be free. Then the noise and nonsense of the world and even a lot of the noise and nonsense in the church will simply hush, right? Because sometimes, yes, we get so confused with what happens in the world, right? And it's confusing. You know, we have wars, we have uh, atrocities happening, we have crimes, we have uh, economic crisis, we have all kinds of stuff that happens. But then if we are, have our eyes placed in God, and if we have our eyes placed into everything that is spiritual that we need so much, what is going to happen? Then, there we go, right? We are going to be not only free, but it at the same time is going to give us that peace of soul we need so much. And then the next step, <laughs> okay, this is going to make us more understanding of the life of the church, but also when nonsense happens outside of the church is going to give us a stability and when nonsense sometimes happens in the church we're also going to find god in stillness i remember very much when pope john paul ii gave the fourth set of uh, mysteries no, mm. the the, mm, luminous, the mysteries. luminous mysteries people who had not picked up the rosary for centuries were announcing and saying, the Pope changed, changed the rosary now? Is that, we don't have to pray the rosary anymore? And we're looking in our, yeah, rolling our eyes and saying, no, no, no. All we have is a set of new mysteries to pray the rosary more, right? It was a way of supplementing and connecting it more closely to the life of Christ because the rosary already was living the life of Jesus through the eyes of Our Lady. This merely just cemented it more. It tied it down a bit tighter. That's all it was. So what happens if we are missing that connection with the liturgical life, if we are missing that connection with prayer, and if we are missing that connection with our Sunday assistance to Mass, then what's going to happen? We're going to be completely flabbergasted by things that are happening in the church. Uh, and they happen all the time, I know. If we read the um, the letters of St. Paul to his churches, they resemble in an amazing way, actually in a very sad way, parishes that we are surrounded by today. The same problems, the same sins are being committed in our parishes as were being committed at the time of Paul or uh, James and his problems with the gossips in his community or Peter with his... Um, his communities that were losing faith and, and becoming cowards, so on and so forth. Okay, I mean, uh, some of the lines are beautiful in St. Paul. St. Paul's lines are beautiful. Who's bewitched you, uh, Galicians or the Corinthians? Imagine, they expelled and excommunicated him from the church. 
And you have what gall, what cheek. And we have ugly cases happening there. Some police, you know, oh, you yeah. read closely and it's just scandals happening. They burnt one of his letters. <laughs> there should have been three letters. There's only two. So, I mean, when we look at today, says, if I only lived at that time, I would have faith. My friend, <laughs> you would be worse. So even a lot of the noise and nonsense abundant on, in, the, in the church will simply hush. And then you will find your God in stillness. That's it. A lot of good advice here. So if we are going to answer this initial question, why people don't go to church, why, people, why churches are empty after Holy Week? Well, let's go back to the basics and let's practice what we need. And then, and then we're going to find a lot of meaning in, in all these practices. The core of why people don't come to church is that they don't find the importance or worse, they themselves have made God themselves. Augustine says in the, in, the, in the Confessions that we have one altar within ourselves, and it can either be for God or for self. When we fashion an idol, a God that accomplishes what we want, we have occupied that altar with ourselves. So we are self Adorators, you can put it that way. Adorers, self-adorers. And because of that, when we encounter the true God in liturgy, at church, in the Eucharist, we are offended. We may have deformed our vision of God so much that we don't recognize Him anymore. But we are offended by the true form. And many of us, I mean, mm -hmm. us, many of us, we can't take that. So we distance ourselves. Um, one of the stories that I was reading was this, that this priest was uh, doing um, tours at St. Peter's. And one of the altars, it's right beside the, sac uh, the sacristy, is a, a mosaic of, uh, of the two people in the Acts of the Apostles, a husband and wife team, who decide they're going to kind of cheap out. They were going to sell their property, but keep some on the side in case of a rainy day and give the apostles a, a portion so that they were happy. Everyone's happy. But they were telling that they were giving everything. Oh, they were telling, they were, they were, they were making it very clear that they had offered everything. And Peter looks at them and said, you lied. And they were struck dead by God right there, fulminated. Boom. And he explained it. Husband and wife, yeah, one they, after the other. Yeah, they both dragged out and both thrown right into the down. streets. Yeah. They didn't bury them, you know that? No. <laughs> <laughs> but what's fascinating was this woman that was present, she says, God wouldn't do something like that. And then the priest, thinking that maybe it was a poor catechesis or a poor, um, un, maybe it was a language problem. You know, something's wrong. He goes, no, it's in the Acts of the Apostles. You have to understand. No, my God wouldn't do that. No, so now it's the priest's fault. Oh, it's the priest's fault, the church's fault, it's <laughs> God's the, the, fault. The, the bishop's fault, the pope's fault, everybody's but fault. But it's from me. I am the chief authority. It's my God who wouldn't do that. In other words, she invented an idol yeah. that she adored. That was her Jesus Christ. And this is a, a problem that we see in social media where we end up with the Jesuses, the Jesus who condones sin, Right, it's very interesting. If we go to, it's a whole other episode. But you go through the, go through the Gospels, and we encounter Christ doing His work with various different people, many of them in very precarious moral situations, and we find Jesus always willing to encounter them. But we always find that when they leave that encounter, they're changed. They have converted. They have turned back to God. Jesus never accepts their spot and just tells them, continue doing what you're doing. If you're stealing, continue stealing. No, he always does this. This is the problem. You are forgiven. Sin no more. Sin no more. Like, sin no more. I don't condemn you. Sin no more. In other words, he forgave the sin, gave her encouragement to go forward. There's our problem with why people have problems with church. That encounter 
in the change isn't there. Maybe we formed another God that now doesn't match anymore with the God we find in the liturgy, right? Yes. Uh, and there is one last consideration probably for this program, and is that uh, like everything, virtue doesn't come. Uh, we can't just go to Amazon you know, and then order, order. Give me, give me. I don't know this. this, this give me the three virtues. theologicals and four cardinal virtues. A prime delivery. I want it tomorrow. I want to download it and order activate. it within two hours, and then we have it tomorrow morning. Activate. No, that takes time, right? And so it costs. But that kind of of perseverance, it's something that we need to wish, we need to desire, and we need to be open to. One thing. Uh, before we end, I just, I just wanted to add, which is something that I was, uh, we were ta I was with my seven eight classroom in the last little while, and we were going over items that pop up in their confirmation classes, um, and we were talking about the seven um, gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I was telling them if you want to do a diagnostic on your soul, go to the fruits. Go to the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Twelve fruits of the Holy Spirit. And ask yourself quietly, with yourself, do I find these items here in myself, in my soul? Do I find that they are there? Or at least, are we searching for them? Are we seeking them? If we are... If we're seeking them, I would say it would be more just like plants. Are they in the form of a bud are they um, leafing? Are they fruits? Who knows? What stage they are? But if they're absent or if they're withered and dead, <laughs> then we know. have to go back to the virtues. And then we have to go back even one step further in that way. You go back and we go to the theological and the moral virtues and figure out which one are we not practicing. Faith, hope, charity, prudence, justice, pr for, uh, fortitude. Where, where, are they, where are we absent? We need to do our own self-diagnostics, and that is done through an, an examination of conscience. So probably can we summarize, Brother Justin, why people don't go to church on Sundays, especially after the Easter season, and then there is complete absence until Christmas? Is it because the fruits of the Holy Spirit are not there? Is it because we are not seeking for those? And or the opposite. Let's let's put it this way: If we were seeking for those fruits, probably the pews would be full. Absolutely, I think we would be in a very different world if we were a virtuous people. So let's ask our lady. Let's finish with a short prayer since we have today. We, we don't have today, Father, to bless us. But don't worry, it's coming back for the next next episode. And uh, let's pray to our lady and ask that the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the, 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 the gifts of the Holy Spirit, if we don't have them, well, at least let's ask for them. And remember that assiduous attendance to Mass, the frequency of the sacraments, prayer. I think one thing we may, may not have mentioned a little bit yes. is a real devotion to Our Lady. Mm -hmm. She is the... Refuge of sinners, console the afflicted. She is the one who will activate those graces in us. He's a spouse of the Holy Spirit. But when we are lost in ourselves, when we do this self-exam, we don't lose heart because we cling. To, we fly to her patroness, O Holy Mother of God. And as a last recommendation, go down to the notes of the program. You have a link there. You can click it, and you can join us for the courses of Consecration to a Lady, which are being done right now by thousands of people all over the world. And so let's ask our Lady then her blessing, and again, that a complete idea, notion of how much we need our spiritual life to be reshaped and to be constantly kept afresh. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.